Chancellor, the principal, my dear sister, the Vaki, faculty, esteemed students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This is a very emotional moment for me. And uh, I want to start by uh, lowering your expectations. <laughs> we are not going to have a lecture as uh, you would expect in a distinguished uh, institution like Oxford. I'm not an academic. I am an activist. I know how to have a conversation, but I do not know how to prepare a lecture. So can we agree, instead of a lecture, we have a conversation? Second, I want really to thank my dear sister, Devaki, for having uh, convinced me to, to come. I don't look like, but I'm very shy, and I don't feel very comfortable when I have to address luminaries. So I tried to avoid it and asking her to say, you know, I have, I'm too busy. But she convinced me. So I am here and uh, I will try my best to bring a sort of a different kind perspective of uh, Africa and Africa seen through the lens of its women. Many of you, the image which comes to your mind, uh, which is transmitted through the screens of your televisions and uh, what you hear uh, through the, the media generally, it is that uh, we Africans, uh, we are dying of AIDS, uh, we are, uh, have uh, all those kind of things. I want to tell you a narrative a different narrative of Afghan women. In fact, of who we are. How do we see ourselves, our struggles, our fears sometimes, our successes, our doubts, but how we are shaping uh, a new Africa for ourselves, for our children, and our grandchildren. You may have also uh, been told of uh, something called Africa Arising. But he, let me remind you, 50, Africa has celebrated recently 50 years of uh, its freedom, the establishment of African Union. And uh, those of you who followed, you heard names of uh, heads of state and uh, all those people, but he, you didn't hear of a name, and you didn't see a face of a woman during those 50 years of our liberation. And I thought it is uh, an indictment maybe to ourselves as women that we have not been putting ourselves in front and to say we were there. And that freedom was uh, achieved uh, through struggles and contribution and sometimes sacrifice of life of millions, literally, of millions of women. So one of the things which I have been very uh, keen to do uh, in uh, the rest of uh, my life is to bring the names of African women and whenever it's possible, their faces. And. Um, I even established a movement through the small institution I run, a movement we call Multiplying Faces, Amplifying Voices of African Women. And it is also to do with the fact that when we talk of African women who have contributed, we always look at one single uh, sector or one single walk of life. And we, you may have heard of women who have been in politics, but you know very little of women in business, women in science, women in the media, women in culture, women in other sectors of life. You know very little. 
and it is our fault. I want to take it. It is our fault. And the contribution I want to make this morning is precisely just to bring names of a few of them. Africa has uh, now to come to a, a point where a child, boy or girl, can visualize a woman as a head of state. 20 years ago, this was not the reality. There was no one, and children couldn't have a reference of seeing a woman as a head of state. One of the recent developments which happened is when we had Ellen Johnson as the first elected president of Liberia. Then we had uh, Joyce Banda from Malawi. She was, there. she was there for a very short time, but she was there. Now we have uh, our sister Catherine Samapanza in Central Africa. We do have a few uh, vice presidents of whom maybe you have never heard. I don't know whether you know that Zambia has a vice president. Um, we do have prime ministers, a young lady from uh, Namibia. Her name is um, uh, Amadzilla, not Amatilla, Amadzilla. She is in her 40s and she's the prime minister. We had in my own country, Mozambique, a prime minister in the age of, uh, of her 40s. But it, those faces are not familiar because they are not being brought to the knowledge. We have, as we speak, a head of state uh, in um, Mauritius. I don't know whether you have heard of that. Of that. Her name is Amina Gurib Fakim, who was elected unanimously uh, by her parliament, and she has been now the head of state of that country. Now, you also have heard that we have uh, uh, some of the countries, Rwanda is the best example where you have about 56% of uh, parliamentarians are women. And uh, South Africa, Mozambique, uh, uh, Namibia, they have over 40% of parliamentarians are women. Many other countries are making progress in 30%. There are others who are struggling. They don't even have more than uh, eight, 9%. Why this is important to mention is because the visibility of African women in the public space, it is no longer a taboo. It is no longer something which children struggle to see. But I want to caution. It doesn't mean that those women have managed to change structurally the balance of power in those institutions. So what I'm saying is that we achieved the first step of visibility. What is the second step which has to happen, in my view, is this women to change the nature of power, to contribute to humanize power, to make it much more sensitive and much closer to people, to represent the aspirations, and even to allow people themselves to materialize their dreams. I don't think it's uh, an issue of Africa alone, but it, the idea of modern democracies and seen through a feminist perspective, which is the title of our conversation today, for me is that, yes, we do have elections. Yes, we have more women, and sometimes even we have youth in institutions of power. But power is too far from people. The institutions which are expected to represent our people are very far, and people themselves are struggling with the needs, with the materialization of their rights, and we seem to be living actually in two worlds in which institutions move in one direction and people are moving and solving their own issues also uh, in one direction. Which means 
the presence and visibility of women in power has to be applauded. I do applaud it, but I know it's not sufficient. We need to go to the second stage, as I said, humanize power, using the strength of women in that ability to connect, the ability of women to multitask, the ability of women to build those relationships which many times they are informal, but it, precisely because they are informal, they form the formal and they improve the formal. That has not been yet the case of coming to influence the centers of power. We do have, for instance, an African woman who is uh, under secretary uh, 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 as U UN women, Pumzili Nguka. But the UN women within the UN family is the poorest of agencies. It doesn't have resources. It doesn't have much influence. So visibility, yes. Institutions, yes. But it, does it make a big difference in terms of what the UN is today because we have UN women? I would like to leave it to you to discuss this. We have in our own continent Kosezane um, Glamini Zuma, who is the chair of the African Union Commission for the first time. We salute the fact that, yes, for the first time we have a chair of African Union Commission who is a woman. She has done a lot to try to change, I mean, the African Union, the way it operates. She even instituted like a year, a whole year of celebrating women. As we speak, we are going to have next week a summit only on the girl child, where heads of states, heads of government, ministers, all of them are going to be discussing the place and how do we treat the girl child on the continent. These are very good developments, but the reality is that the African Union has not changed fundamentally, simply because we do have a woman who is chairing it there. We could even give other examples in terms of uh, 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 women who are in positions like, you know, finance, they are in ministries of mineral resources, which are the issue of development on the continent today. But it, all this requires a fundamental change of change the structures, which are still marginalizing women you have, must have learned that uh, the woman who was behind the whole movement of uh, developing the uh, sustainable development goals, uh, which are successors of MDGs, is Amina Mohammed. She is a woman from Nigeria. I worked with her. She was really extraordinary to bring together all the different groups and millions of contributions of what it should be, the SDGs. She did a fantastic job. Again, respecting different sensitivities, different points of view, but keeping focus in what was fundamental. And to make of these SDGs much more focused on people, much more focused on how we are going to lay the foundations of what we can call the building blocks of sustainable development. We had that discussion with Amina very strongly. She did a fantastic job, but the, in essence, the SDGs, if they are to be implemented and really mean a fundamental change, it will depend on the balance of power within member states is going to be within the UN. And that's the point I'm making. So without tiring you with examples, I want to say that uh, Africa has powerful, energetic, focused women in leadership. But they still have a long way to go in the public space to change structures, because that's where. Then we can open the 
avenues for millions then to come. Let me come now to give some examples in the economic sphere, whether it's finance, business, and productive life. You have heard of uh, Ngozi or Konjo Iwala, who until recently she was Minister of Finance, who shook actually, I mean, the system of finances in Nigeria, in a country like Nigeria, and she did a fantastic job as Minister of Finance in bringing the debt of Nigeria down and negotiating with the big powers for that. Yes, that's very important. She is a woman and young. And she is recognized as one of the best bright minds, I mean, in finance today. We have women like, uh, I want to bring a very good example of a young woman from South Africa, her name is Sibongile Sam Sambo, who established, she is the founder of uh, the first aviation company owned by women, 100%, and she leads this. And you'll say, oh, aviation? Women? Yes, of course. And these are examples of uh, extraordinary inventiveness which is coming from Africa. You have, may, may have heard of Daphne Mishili Nkosi, who negotiated a big deal of manganese in, uh, in South Africa. And she is uh, at the helm of a company which is employing 30,000 people in mining industry. And mining industry today is still a business of uh, other people in gray suits. But she is there, and she is making a difference. You may have heard of, uh, of a young lady called Rapelang Rabana. Uh, she is also a South African entrepreneur. And she is just 23, but she co-founded Yego Communications, which became one of the first companies in the world to offer voice over internet protocol services for mobile phones at the age of 23. And these names and these faces are not brought to our knowledge. In Kenya, a young lady of name Juliana Rotef, she established a software platform called Ushahidi, which monitored the violence which you heard of of 2007, 2008, I was there as one of the mediators. But she founded, she established a software system to monitor where, who, and how. And she helped exactly to identify who were invo involved in violations of human rights at that time. And she is one of those young ladies now recognized as a global, global leader of the World Economic Forum, and she's actually part of the Global Agenda Council on Information, Communication, and Technology. Yes, very young. You must have heard also of Hadil Ibrahim, the executive director of Mo Ibrahim. Tiny young lady, but she moves one of the foundations which is making a huge impact on the continent on issues of governance, particularly on governance. Yes, Close to you here, you have heard of name of Dambisa Moyo, who really shook the, aid, the, the, the world of aid. The first time when she writes and she says, uh, well, development aid for low-income economies mm, is doing more harm than good. Many of us were shocked. But she produced, I mean, a very thoughtful analysis of how many times African governments relying too much on aid, they didn't unleash the ability of their own countries to face their challenges like that. And she was attacked at the beginning, actually, as being uh, too controversial. But today, yes, we do recognize the development of African countries rely in unleashing African resources, African manpower, African institutions to be able to move and work on our own feet instead of depending on aid. And she was, I mean, uh, she, 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 she did her PhD here at Oxford. We could be talking of women like uh, uh, Mary Onyango, who is 
very well recognized in working with the with the, what we can call uh, sustainable using and methods of productions of indigenous African crops. Why this is very important? It's because, again, if we are to develop agriculture and to feed ourselves, we have to recognize that we have crops which are very much indigenous, they are nutritious, and they have to be gain the same value much more than what Monsanto can produce as seeds, I mean, to sell to African countries. And this woman from Kenya, she's doing a fantastic work exactly giving value to indigenous, indigenous African crops, not only for Kenya, but Africa as such. Let me come to the area of science, in which we have also lots of good examples. One of the global challenges of our time is to invent vaccines. Vaccines which can clean up in terms of prevention of the uh, epidemics which are affecting developing countries. Some of the best examples in scientists who are in this are women. I'm sure you have heard of uh, uh, Professor uh, Kwarisha Abdul Karim. She is at the University of KwaZulu Natal. She is one of the laureates of uh, Laureate UNESCO for Women in Science. She won the award. And in African Arab states, by the way. And she is very much in the forefront of uh, discovering a vaccine for HIV. And these examples of women who are at the forefront, many times are not, again, I'll insist, they are not being brought to our attention. We know of Nagwa Megid, an Egyptian genetics who had identified several genetic mutations that cause common syndromes such as the, the, the uh, autism, for instance. And this is, one of the issues which affect millions of kids in our continent and no one simply don't know how to deal with. I could go on and on giving some other examples. Let me mention maybe culturally. You have heard of young writers who are really prolific writers like uh, the young lady from uh, Nigeria. I think some of you, I hope some of you have, uh, have read about uh, Mamanda uh, Ngozi Aditya. She is very much in the, in the media. But let me go back and remember with such respect, Wangari Matai. She was the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize because of her campaign and leadership as environment far before people would look at environment as a fundamental issue of our development and sustainability. This year we are going to have the conference in Paris, now at the end of this month and the beginning of next month. And I hope we'll take one minute to remember Wangar, who mobilized millions of women in Africa and in the world actually to pay attention to bring women as part of the solution of the sustainability of our planet far behind when people would think of that. Let me uh, recall, for instance, some of uh, storytellers. We Africans, we are very good storytellers and there's a young lady called Bush Emerson who said, Women are born storytellers. We keep the history. We are the true conservatives. We conserve things and we never forget. What I do is not clever or unusual. It is what my aunt and grandmother did and their mothers before them. And she came with a very strong element of saying the today and the future has to recognize and value where we come from and our own identity. These are some of the examples. I would end up with the Theosoa, a young lady who happens to be uh, a board member of my trust. She runs an African organization which is providing grant making uh, 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 programs to thousands and thousands of women in 43 
countries of the continent. I do not know of a bigger network of grant making by Africans, by an African woman, by, bigger than this. So I tried to say today, my conversation about African women is the movement which is emerging, which has not had enough recognition, which has not had enough visibility, but it is, either it's in business, either it's in science, either it's in culture, you have thousands and thousands of African women who are reshaping the continent. Those who are not even dependent of being elected. They fight and they build and they gain a space in the sun through their intellect, through their creativity, through their inventiveness. These are the women who are telling the new narrative of Africa, but a new narrative of African women. And I would like you, when we have this conversation, to come and uh, reflect and open much more your eyes, not to that very limited space. I'm not here to underestimate the challenges we face. I want to end up acknowledging that I chair a partnership, which is called the Partnership on Maternal, Neonatal, Child and Adolescent Health, because we recognize that Africa, Asia, and Latin America, we still have unnecessary deaths of women, newborns, and children. We have to deal with this. But this is not what defines us as societies. We are defined in a much more positive way. We recognize our challenge, we confront them, but at the same time, we assert ourselves in the community of nations as productive and creative as we are. And that's the narrative of the African women I wanted to share with you today. We are an emerging giant. And there are two, to end, there are two social groups who are redefining that narrative. Women, youth. I do not have the time to discuss youth today, but you know, these are the two majorities of our people. 52% of Africans are women. 60% of Africans are under the age of 25. These are the ones who are going to turn, and they are turning Africa around. Open your eyes, do your research, look into our communities, Look at our networks. I could tell you of the networks which I helped to establish myself. Those are the ones who are rewriting and who are telling the world who we are. And I thought this morning, this is what I would like to share with you. Thank you very much. I think one of the issues which um, human family globally has to confront is the way we socialize women and we socialize men. I think the, 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 the seed of the problem reside in the fact that women are socialized to be, you know, they are the caring, they are, even myself, I was saying here, the ability to interconnect, etc. and I'm talking of humanizing power. And men are socialized to be the strong ones, to be in position of power precisely. And 
Now with this world which is changing, where women are asserting themselves, whether it is at the workplace, whether it is in different uh, areas in which they are, now the relations of power between privately now between men and, uh, and, 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 and women is no longer, I mean, of a, I mean, subservient woman and a man who is above. And forgive me mentioning this. I mean, the Bible also says that, you know, the man is the head of the family and the woman is something which I do not know. I don't know whether it's the hands or it's the, the legs of the family. <laughs> but this is not said clearly. We know who is the head. And the woman, I do not know whether it's the legs or it's the hands. And all this, the way we socialize, determine the behavior of people, and particularly. So my challenge to you as researchers, please begin to deal with the issue of masculinity. What defines you as a young man, or a man who is mature, as being masculine? And then what are the strengths of women or being feminine? in which, like nature, quite rightly, because nature is always right, nature has told us that men need women, and women need men. And only when they meet in a relationship of love, I want to insist, in a relationship of love, that's when a new life is born. That's nature. We are expected as human to relate to one another as men and women in a relationship of love, and it's out of love, then a new life can emerge. That's nature. Nature doesn't tell, you, tell us that you have to brutalize the other, you have to beat and kill if it's necessary, to assert your position. That is not nature. So we try, as human, we try to change the rules of what nature tells us. And we introduce alien elements in this relationship. And that's why in, we are in this conflict. You are right. It is everywhere. It's not only in Europe. It's not only in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. It's everywhere. Gender violence is endemic as we speak. And I think it is time we begin to question how do we socialize our children beginning from there. Yes, we can have all the laws and we can, but the fundamental attitude is how a woman will see herself, I mean, shoulder to shoulder, and a man will see himself shoulder to shoulder in complementarity with another human being who happens to have a different sex. As we are beginning to have issues with religion, as we are beginning to have serious problems with ethnicity, this is the issue. So you say, what we do, and I think for you, I mean, as, as really, you, you have to help us, the activists, to have the right arguments of how do we change this from the bottom, starting the problem really from the bottom. Science has to come across and help to find this because, as I'm saying, it's endemic. The other question was women in public sector. The reason I think the reason why, uh, despite the numbers, at least in my continent, I mean, numbers of women in public sector has increased very, very considerably. But the reason why uh, change has not been so fundamental, in my view, is that women themselves, sometimes when they have this position of power, you know, they, they, they lose the femin eh? femini femininity, okay? 
They want to prove that now because they are the bosses, you know, being a boss, it means you have to be commanding. You can be a driver of a car. You can be a driver of a train without being violent. You don't have to change your nature. This is what. Instead of bringing precisely the soft skills which are so important in human relations, and I'm saying human relations, to bring them to power, that's why I'm talking to humanize power, because human relations by, by in essence are really to communicate, it's to, to allow us, I mean, to share, yeah? to have the empathy of seeing yourself in our language in Africa, I am because you are, you are because I am, okay? Instead of that, many women, when they get into a position of power, they change because they want to prove. I think that's the problem. Is power, yes, but continue to be human. Assertiveness and leadership doesn't mean that you have to be What is the word in English? Will you help me? What I'm trying to say. You see, right? And that is the problem. So we, instead of changing the structures, we are being co-opted by structures. And that's the problem. I could give examples. With no offense. With no offense. You remember Goldmeier? Huh? Yeah. She was a prime minister. She was a woman. But that lady was not a woman while she was a prime minister. <laughs> you remember? We have our own example here with due respect. <laughs> I don't have to mention name, okay? Okay, okay, okay. These are the, the consummate examples of having women who are, when they are in a position of power, they are everything except being women. And you see, I'll give you an example. I'm sorry if I'm taking too long. During the crisis, during the crisis of the, the, the financial crisis, I was watching television and I see the, the, the G20 group. And they were talking about restructuring the financial system, re-engineering, there were lots of re, 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 what they were doing. And I said to myself, but yeah, now they messed up with this system and now they are re-engineering. Where is the voice of women? You remember? And that's when I, I, I decided to establish a network of African women in, in finance. I called girls from different sectors in financial system and I said, come together and tell me. They are changing the rules of the game in the financial system. I don't see your voice, I don't see your face. You have to be seated there where decisions are being made. This network of African women in finance I'm talking about, now, now, it is in 15 countries, we have chapters in 15 countries, and we confront ministers of finance, we confront governors of central banks, we confront the CEOs of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the financial institutions, but more than this is to say, change the rules so that women can have access to finance, and some of them they are. More importantly, we work with the grassroots, and to educate women in what you can call financial literacy, but more importantly, to bring women who have never been part of the formal financial system to enter through a long process of training, opening a bank account, how you manage your loans, how et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A good example, if you like, I can mention from Uganda, a young lady who is our member who is running a program. In one district alone, one district alone, she organized together with the, the, the district commissioner, with the bank, with different business people. In one year, she was able to bring 250,000 people into the formal system. And this is the change we want with the ministers, with the central bank who are the regulators, with the CEOs of banks, but also, I mean, we work with women to make sure that they have to emerge, they have to take opportunities. As I'm speaking today, Yesterday and today, we are meeting, our trust is meeting with all the CEOs in financial institutions who have made pledges. 
Because we have been there and we ask whenever, pledge what you're going to change. So we take note of the pledges. And we say, no, 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 this is very complicated to go one by one. So we bring them together. They are in Johannesburg, as I speak, to go and see one you pledged in 2010. You pledged in 2011, 12, 13. This is what you pledged to do. Where are we now? Because some of them, they said, no, we are going to increase the number of, uh, of loans for women for housing. We are going to do this. They promised lots of things. So now we are going one by one to say, how do you meet your promises? So we are quite clear that in financial system, if you don't come from the top, but at the same time, if you don't come from the bottom to meet in the middle, the financial system will never be sensitive to needs of women. And you know, in Africa, the so-called informal sector, you know of it, huh? That's where millions of us we are. Millions of us. We said, why are we always to be born and die informal? We also want to be informal, so let's work for it. And this is what we are doing. I'm trying to explain that if you don't change structures, you can say whatever you want. I have been in women's rights, uh, rights issues for decades now. The reason why our success is so limited, we don't change the structural issues which are hindering women to move in waves. That's what the politics have to do. Don't sit there and try to be nice, a nice minister. And then I want to come to your example. You are not going to be talking to people huh, dressed as I am, huh, high heels, huh, okay, and speaking in English, you don't speak the language of the people. You don't dress like they are. You don't sit with them and explain things. Of course, power will be in parliament, but the people will be in slums and will be in rural areas. And between the two, there's no meeting. And that's in the public sector. Look at how our parliamentarians, uh, how they present themselves. And it sometimes it's so interesting. Humble people we knew as humble people. They become parliamentarians. The following day, they look like, I don't know, they dress like me. I dress like this because I am at Oxford. <laughs> but when you find me, when you find me with my networks in rural areas, I'm completely a different woman. So I know how to be in Oxford, <laughs> and I know how to be in the UN, because also I am there. But uh -uh, when it comes to our people, I know how I present myself, and I know even what language I'm going to use. That's the problem with the public sector. And you, you know the laws we have? Huh? The laws we have made, they are models according to the, you know, the British and the French and the Portuguese system. But honestly, the millions of people, how much of English they know? Just language, English, for them to understand the law. How much of French they know? How much of Portuguese they know? Are you surprised? Baby girl, are you surprised? No, that's the problem. We didn't challenge the structures. And I'm not saying this is not good. I'm saying you need to make them meet halfway. And that kind of transformation has not happened in our continent. And that's why we fail in our development things. I mentioned that today I'm not going to be focusing on youth, unfortunately, because we don't have the time. But just to give a little bit of context, the, the radical change in the approach of the fighting apartheid came in 76, and it was through students in Soweto, those of you who have been following history. This roads must fall is the prelude of a fundamental transformation of the education system if it's not in South Africa, in Africa. Because what I was mentioning now, it is exactly what the students are telling us. To say, fine, we respect history. We respect those who have established institutions like Cape Town, University of Cape Town. 
But the 20 years down freedom in South Africa, they don't have, in my university, and I take responsibility for that, a road which has been named the National Heroes. But they have roads. So perhaps the students should not have said necessarily that the roads should fall, but they should have said that, you know, the first professor, African professor at UCT, who was the first one, as you celebrate yours here, the first ones, should be also, I mean, a symbol of freedom and should be erected at UCT. And who says UCT says uh, at, uh, at Wits and all universities? But the students, young as they are, impatient as they are. They didn't think of building the balance to say, let's keep history. They just say, fall and erect. You know what I mean? So that's the problem. And we are talking to students to say, fine. And because there was no way we could communicate with them if we didn't allow that, that statue to fall. So we had really to let it fall. But now we are in a long conversation, which was followed, as you know, by fees must fall. It was first, roads must fall, and now it's fees must fall. And the president was so, so, so pressurized, and he came and said, oh, let's have a moratorium for 2016, and then we'll see what to do. The students went in fire. They said, no, 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 no. We want a sustainable and long-term solution for fees. Now, you are young people, and you are professors here. Is South Africa in condition to give free education, I mean tertiary education for all? No one is able to do that. So the, 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 the discussion is to say, the young students who cannot pay, and they have a right to a free education, but the young other students whose families can pay, and they must pay. Because there's no country, at least now, in, this, in the position where the, the economy is, despite the improvement which is taking place, there's no country which can give free, tertiary. You know why? Because the moment you give tertiary free, then you have to give the secondary, the primary, and the, the pre-school. From the top up to, you have to give free. Our economies cannot afford yet. I'm saying yet. So we are in this discussion. And UCT actually came, it was the first very unpopular, because our vice chancellor, not me, but our vice, vice chancellor came and said, I am against free, uh, free fees for all. And everybody went red. He said, no, I am for. Free for those who cannot pay, a contribution for those who can contribute and pay completely for those who can. So you do the escalation according to the capacity of families to do, because that's where we are. I must tell you that UCT has already, I mean, a movement of uh, contribution. Some of the, this evening, by the way, I'm going to be seeing people in London. We have a, 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 an endowment and if you contribute to our endowment, suppose you give 100 pounds, 50 goes to endowment for our sustainability, and 50 goes to bursary program we have. We are doing this already. It's not because of uh, fees must fall. We have been doing this because we recognize that part of transformation is precisely to bring students from disadvantaged schools to have, I mean, the best UCT today is if it's not the, it's one of the best universities in Africa. And we want them to come. And you know what we do even? We recognize that when they come to UCT, some of them, they've never had a lab in a secondary school. Their English as a language of communication is not the best. They never had a library. They never have a computer. So what we do, we have what we call a bridging course. A bridging course which is sharpening language communication, which is taking students to know how to use a library, 
taking students to use a computer. We have computer labs for this. Maths, to strengthen maths, whether you're going to humanities or you are going to whatever you have to know, maths. So we take 10 months to prepare our students to, I mean students coming from disadvantaged schools to go into this so that they will be in the same level as other students. So there are ways of dealing with inequality. There are ways of dealing with the past. But it, you can't be so populist now to say everything, everybody has to be, simply because we cannot afford. That's it. But your question was about roads must fall. I think the issue was not only roads. It's it, the issues that, that they, didn't, they didn't demand the erection of uh, the statues of the heroes of liberation struggle. So you keep the two, because part is history, whether you like or not. Who started to build that university? It was not a freedom fighter. So history is history. You can't negate it, but you need to build the balance. That's my view. You know, English is not my language. So I may, I may not be using the right words for what I want to, what I, I mean. But please uh, record the important message. I said humanizing power. And humanity is required from women, and humanity is required from men. What I'm trying to say is that while we have structures which uh, have been mostly dominated by profit, competitiveness, uh, you know those words, you know them very well, right? Mm. Those kind of things. In my perspective, a woman will want to be professionally, I mean, perfect. But she always has her heart at the same level in which she looks at family and in African terms, even in community. So it's to say power, yes, but it's a power which has to have the heart in it, okay? And when I say this, I, I, I put the emphasis on women that they should bring this into the power system because men are, 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 are along the history who have been much more powerful in systems of power, that human face of power or the heart of power, it is many times is power for the sake of power and not power for the face of a woman, the face of a child, the face of a, a, a person living with disability. You see what I'm trying to say? Am I making myself clear? So it's, it's to balance, when I, when I say to humanize power, it is as if I'm suggesting that women have to bring this soft, and the man has to lose this power for the sake of power. And they become simply human. And in human, they use power to serve human beings. Do I make myself clear? That's, that's what I wanted to say. I may not have said it properly. And I will insist that femininity, yes it is, it is important to bring even men in their way of being, they also have something of feminine in them. They do. What I'm trying to say as human, you know, sometimes you'll watch a father who is very power, powerful in office, but in the evening when he's at home with his, particularly with his grandchild, our children, with our children, many times we are still very harsh, all of us, even mothers, okay? But with grandchildren, you just have to observe a father, no matter how powerful he is, observe him in the evening when he has his grandchild. He's softened. I'm talking of soften, softening power. Because we human, we are not numbers. We human beings. We are not machines. We have those feelings. 
and we need to be treated with those feelings. And this is what I'm trying to say, that power today is dissociated with that feeling of the heart of a human being. And that's why it's not a secret. I mean, even here, which is uh, considered one of the developed world, people are becoming very aloof from power. Am I saying something which is uh, not true? No, and why? It's not because we, you don't recognize the, the parliament and the power of parliament, but the, 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 the rules of the game, the game of power, it's a game which is not necessarily the kind of game which makes you feel identified with the way you want to see things happening in your daily life. And this is the difference. So, baby girl, what I'm trying to say is just keep this humanized power. I may have used the issue of uh, they don't have to be soft. I think it's my opinion, you may disagree, but I think the women have the power of softening the, the, the hardness of powerful power. They have that ability to soften the harder side of powerful power. And you bring power for people, power for human beings, in which every day when you make a decision, it's not, you have to remember that the law you make, the regulations you approve, the budget you do, it has to have the face of people. It can't be just as if it's dissociated with the real people who are living in this country, then it will be those who are living in counties, I don't know, one another. In my country, it's in slums, in my country, it is in rural areas. If these two are dissociated, power doesn't serve the human beings we are talking about. And that's what I wanted to try to say. I don't know what I see. So me, I, I have gone through that experience. You are absolutely right. When I became Minister of Education, I was 28 to 10, 29. I was very young. And I was thrown into this cabinet in which I was the single woman there. And I knew whatever the decision I would make, all those people there, they wouldn't be looking at me to say, as a human being, I made a mistake. They would say, she is a woman. She was given power, and look what she's doing with the power she has in her hands. I knew that I was carrying the responsibility of try to be successful in what I'm doing because all women of my country would be judged on the basis of what I do. It's hard. I've gone through it. I was not told. It's very hard. But at the same time, not to boast myself, you know, the, the secret was to say, okay, we, we, we are not going to do it, we as Ministry of Education alone. We need to go out there and mobilize parents, mobilize community leaders, mobilize, I mean, people in rural and urban areas who say this business of education, it doesn't belong to one ministry. It belongs to families because it's your children. It belongs to communities because it's your life you want to progress. So let's build a movement in support of education. That's the softness which I'm talking about. Am I making myself clear? Don't carry the responsibility to say, oh no, because no, I'm minister, I can have laws, I can, no, 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 no. These children, which you are entrusted to have them in schools, remember, they come from a cultural background which you cannot understand if you don't talk to the communities they come from. It's the interest of parents to send these children to school. They have aspirations about their children. You need to listen to them. And that's where I learned. It was not like a Bible I was given. I learned to have what we call, what today you call school governing bodies. Our school governing bodies actually they were very unconventional. They were not necessarily like the ones here. Very unconventional. We had people who didn't read and write in our, in our uh, uh, governing, bo uh, governing bodies. But they were the people the community respected. The community who had the voice I mean, people who had the voice of a certain setting in which that school was. And we brought him, them, to school. And we were making the pressure to our teachers also to 
go to communities. That, that's the kind of, uh, if, if uh, it sounds like I'm not too modest, but I'm trying to say you can soften the hardship of what you have to do if you take it back to those who will give you the legitimacy. Because that's the other thing. Power has to have legitimacy. And who gives you the legitimacy? It's the people you have to serve. And that's the point. So when I talk of humanizing, I was talking of humanizing power, and I can add even to say, strengthen the legitimacy, which is not given alone through the vote. Yes, the vote is important, but more than the vote, legitimacy of power will be strengthened if you are able to connect exactly to those who have given the right to sit in parliament. Am I clear? Now, finally, you were, you were, you were, you, I was, I was, uh, you, you, you were making a comment on, on the, the lady in Kenya. Kenya is my second home, you know, maybe third. Second is Tanzania. But uh, I was there at the mediation of the 2007-2008 thing. Actually, for the constitution to be drafted the way it was, yes, of course, the merit, it was of Kenyans themselves. But we made sure, when I say we, it was Kofi Annan and Ben Mkapa and myself, we made sure that uh, Kenya will have the advice of the best constitutionalists. I can't say these words in English. But it, these, these brains who know better of uh, how a constitution really has to be. And that's why the constitution of Kenya today, it's even better in certain aspects than the constitution of South Africa, because it came later. And it had an obliga obligation to be better. And it did take a lot of, uh, Kenya has some of the brightest minds you can find. So, but that was not enough. We said, you have to bring people to help you. And even to bring, uh, I mean, somebody to help about the big alliance which was necessary at the time. But what you are saying is, the Constitution is very clear. Women in the counties, at this level, it is OK. But you know that in Parliament, the 30% which is in the Constitution has not materialized in, 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 in Parliament. You know why? It's exactly what I was talking about, power. They were even, they were so blunted to say immediately, not this election, but the first one before this, when President Kibaki had to, to step down. They said, no, it's okay, the Constitution says 30%, but not now. <laughs> How do you adopt a Constitution? And then next thing you do is to act against a Constitution. But this is what they did. Why? Because yes, they knew, intellectually they knew that was very important. But emotionally, they were not prepared to open space. Why? Because they would have to step down to allow women to come up. And they were not prepared to do this. Even now, Kenya doesn't have the 30% which the Constitution says. Why? Because they are not, but some people, they are not prepared to step down to allow the 30% to come up. You can't be all the same plus 30%. You can't. You have, some of you have to come down, and then you'll have the 30%. That's what we are talking about. One thing is what you say, you write, and one thing is the transformation people have to accept that this thing called power has to be shared with women. And it has to be shared with young people. Our parliament... Tim, our parliament in Africa? Oh, young people, they, they joke, they say, oh, it's all gray hair. That's how they call us. It's gray hair. Because there's no space, there's, there, there's no open space for young people to sit in our parliament. Very, very token ones are sitting there. But I told you that 60% of the African population, 60%, they are under 25. How can you make decisions without them? It's their life today. 
this story of saying, oh, leaders of tomorrow. No, they are leaders of today because they are the majority. And democracy, I mean, the, 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 the word democracy is the rule of majority, isn't it? How do you want to have a democracy and then you don't want majorities to be sitting? That's our problem. They say, oh, yes, democracy. And, but it, when it comes to say, okay, but it means that you have to sit aside and you open space for other people who are women, who are young people. That is the problem. They bribe elections just to make sure that they will remain in parliament. Don't you know of that? Don't you know? Yeah, so we have a long way to go. <laughs> but we will get there. We are changing. With all this, Tim, I think I should stop now. <laughs> with all this, <laughs> with all this, all I want to say is that Africa is really changing.